It's all part of the plan. Zero. But when I say the plan, you are coming with me. On the fifth of November, that shall never, ever be forgotten. Robocop. Marvel of storytelling. Celebration of 1980s cinema. Springboard for this guy. <laughs> I'd buy that for a dollar. <laughs> the fact that this movie got made, got released, and blew up at the box office is a testament to the creative spirit. And it was definitely a creative spirit that conjured this up. It's back. Big is back. RoboCop follows the prime directives of storytelling. Build a solid plot structure, engage the audience with empathetic characters, fulfill the genre expectations. Directive 4 is, of course, classified and a little shady, so we'll have to get to that later. Let's start with the structure. It opens with the first of many commercials and news reports. Normally, something like this would be chalked up to crappy TV exposition, but not here. The content of what we're seeing and hearing isn't telling us the story, but just setting up the world and tone of the film, and setting it up perfectly. We get a few hints of things to come. We're introduced to the antagonists, and shown that our setting is going to be lorded over by Omni Consumer Products a moniker that was no doubt coined by some PR wizard who wanted mass appeal, especially from the kids. Then we home in on the story world. We visit the rundown police precinct in old Detroit, where we get an immediate whiff of corruption, poor working conditions, underfunding, and disgruntled workers in this facility that appears to have not been upgraded in any way since around, oh, 1987? A highly fictionalized and pessimistic view of a city that's actually a utopian paradise in real life. Our story catalyst or inciting incident arrives when OCP rolls out its newest consumer product. Ed 209. Only to have it mow down a junior executive in a demo that would easily top any YouTube boardroom fails compilation. This is enough to get the RoboCop project the green light and soon after, Murphy gets murdered by Clarence Boddicker. After an economical rebuild resurrection montage comes the Act 2 turn. Robocop tests out his piece, Reed tosses him his keys, and he pulls out of the station. Robocop is on duty. Go get him, boy. Then comes the fun and games of Act 2. Robocop busting bad guys. He beats up the liquor store robber, Ends the career of an attempted rapist. Uses his fist to convince a hostage-taking ex-city councilman that he really did get voted out. Does some PR work at Lee Iacocca Elementary School. And so on. Stay out of trouble. The midpoint is the beginning of RoboCop's human side emerging and overcoming his programming. He has a dream that pushes him to take to the streets but not before his old partner Lewis recognizes him and calls him by name. Murphy, it's you. Better alive, you are coming with me. Then when he interrupts a robbery, the thug Emil recognizes him as the cop he and his buddies killed. We killed you! This all sparks him into remembering who he was, and prompts him to go to his old house, find out about his family, and realize everything he's lost. This also puts him onto Clarence Boddicker and the rest of his minions. Robocop now has a new goal. Revenge. Let's talk. After working his way up the scumbag ladder and arresting Boddicker, I work for Dick Jones! Dick Jones reveals himself as Boddicker's benefactor. Jesus, you really screwed up. Come in, officer. You are under arrest. Here, we find out what that classified fourth directive is. OCP employees have blanket immunity from RoboCop. This leads us to a perfect death moment, with RoboCop facing off against Ed 209 who is the future of law enforcement. 
Yeah, I just can't quite negotiate stairs. And then Robo's own cohorts are ordered to turn against him, and he's shot to pieces. We break into Act 3 when he's rescued by the ever-loyal Lewis. He does a little self-repair, and then we see Murphy's face again bringing out still more of his human identity for the big showdown in that staple 80s action movie battleground, the Steel Mill. Looking for me? There's a great climax where our hero steps in to return Lewis's life-saving favor in a shot that director Verhoeven described as the American Jesus walking on water with a gun. There's a shift back into crisis after some quick handy crane work from Leon and Boddicker gets the upper hand. It seems things could be over for old Robo until an bout of purely humanistic improvisation that completes the arc of his human self emerging, he deploys his data transferring knuckle spike and Boddicker finally gets his. Then, in one more third act twist, Robocop goes to OCP to deliver some justice to Dick Jones. This time, armed with evidence that Jones had Bob Morton killed. Damn, that thing comes in handy. But there's still the problem of Directive 4. But then, in a fantastic ending, inevitable but surprising in its obvious simplicity, the old man proclaims... Dick, you're fired! Thank you. <laughs> and that's all she wrote for Dick Jones' OCP privilege and for Dick Jones. In the denouement, he's asked his name. Nice shooting, son. What's your name? And responds accordingly. Murphy. Having fully realized his true essence, the synthesis of part man, part machine, all cop. Absolutely clinical story construction. And this barely scratches the surface. Robert Lockard at DejaReviewer.com has a great article about how RoboCop is perfectly symmetrical, with the opening and closing scenes mirroring each other, and how this pattern continues all the way into the midpoint. Now that is some serious design work, unlike... Now on to characters. There's lots here to empathize with. Our protagonist, Murphy, is the new guy in a rough precinct, and we soon find out he's a skilled, charismatic, duty-driven cop and a dedicated family man who twirls his service weapon to impress his son, and... Okay, okay, I got a kick out of it. And this likability radiates to his partner, Lewis. As soon as we meet her, we see she's tough, seasoned, maybe a little jaded and frustrated with the hazards of the job, but nonetheless committed to it, and to her new partner. Glad to know you, Murphy. Pretty neat. Even if she drops the ball here and there to do a little, uh, meat gazing. <laughs> I'm a little unclear about how long Murphy and Lewis actually work together. I don't know how much time passes between when we see them first hit the streets and when they get the call about Boddicker and his goons fleeing the robbery. But it's possible that they were only paired up for a few short hours before he was killed. But in that time, there was already some friendly banter a little tension, and that familiar sense of camaraderie that comes from jointly coping with a bad situation. They swiftly formed a bond that would sustain through three movies, even after Murphy became unrecognizable and put on a jetpack. Of course, this is all punctuated by Murphy's brutal slaying, which lays on a disturbing dose of suffering that he patently doesn't deserve at the hands of some truly sadistic scumbags who enjoy every moment of it. 
So right at the jumping off point, we have an expertly established opposition between a protagonist we're rooting for and an antagonist we utterly despise. Let's talk genre. RoboCop is an R-rated sci-fi action romp with a fine layer of just enough 80s cheese on top to give it the flavor of a classic. Thank you for your cooperation. I'll buy that for a dollar! <laughs> the R rating is definitely earned. RoboCop does not skimp on the profanity. Is pretty casual with the nudity, though there's room for improvement on this one. And more than delivers on the violence. From the moment poor Kenny gets, uh, not shot, but perforated, we know it is on. There are amputations by shotgun, castration by handgun, melting by toxic waste, and total devastation by a flight of stairs. Sci-fi at its heart is about scientific and or technological advances and their impact on humanity. Whether that effect entails sending us to space or other planets, putting us in contact with artificial or otherworldly beings, allowing us to travel through time, or just carrying us into a bright or much more often grim future. Where this can happen. Robocop perfectly embodies this dichotomy by combining both elements, technology and humanity, in the same character. And this innate internal conflict explores the ethics of commandeering literal human resources and converting them into products to serve society. The expansion of corporatism and the warfare state are also hinted at along with their resulting social decay that leads to people falling for the manipulative marketing of big, dumb, defective products like the 6000 SUX and board games simulating nuclear conflicts. But more on this later. The basic action expectations are pretty easy to meet. Shooting, killing, explosions, big set pieces. Robocop gets all of this done in fine style. But the essence of good action is that the scenes of carnage naturally sprout from a coherent and compelling plot that doesn't stray from the story through line just to throw in a robot ninja battle. Stop them! While it might be tempting to label Robocop as such by those who haven't watched it in a few decades, I challenge anyone to point out one single addition to Robocop's impressive body count that wasn't the product of necessary, probable, and perfectly logical plot progression. They're all in service to the story, including this guy. In the end, Robocop is about the human spirit and its triumph over corruption and how an individual moral champion can defeat a faceless corporate monolith. And who is that champion? The true hero of the piece, Bob Morton. It's a security concept. Come on, come on. I know what you're thinking. What? That Weasley corporate prick that makes light of his coworker being killed? That's a jerk to Lewis and Sergeant Reed while he insists that Robocop is a nameless product? And I've really got you on this one. Didn't he transfer Murphy and others to the Warzone precincts, setting them up to get killed so he could harvest one of their brains for his project? Referring to his candidate as some poor schmuck who volunteers? And then he spends his spare time snorting coke with hookers? That guy's just a rat in the rat race and he's the one that happens to win. Screw him! What are you kidding? You know, and a lot of people would agree with that assessment. This guy's a serious Including RoboCop screenwriters, Edward Neumeyer and Michael Miner. In a featurette, Neumeyer mentions that this character is meant to illustrate the cold ruthlessness of 80s businessmen and their relentless pursuit of wealth. Paul Salmon, a certified RoboCop expert. See, it says so right there. 
described the conception of Morton this way. He's like the quintessential yuppie. He's only into consumption. He's only into excess. He's only into self-satisfaction. He's only into furthering himself. And he has no other agenda except himself. So if the very minds that created Old Bob agree that he was a self-serving waste of space who's better off among the cinders where his house used to be, then who could possibly argue with that? Well, we intend to. A careful watch of this film reveals that the writer's objective to demonize Bob Morton didn't pan out the way they'd intended. It seems that in the telling of this story, like many great characters, Bob grew a life of his own, and actually dictated to his creators what direction he was going to go in, and out of narrative necessity ended up a very different animal than what they'd had in mind. Well, even so, the movie's about RoboCop cleaning up the streets of old Detroit, so why should I care about Bob Morton or some YouTube weirdo's case that he might not be a total jerk? Who cares? Eh, we're glad you asked. The unjustified vilification of Bob has a host of wider thematic aspects embedded in it that, once unpacked, may just leave you looking at this movie in a whole new light. That's why. Now, first of all, they were models, okay? A couple models come to my place, you know what I mean? <laughs> I'd buy that for a dollar. <laughs> I didn't see any money change hands, so how about you hop off that high horse? What do you think, your shit don't stink? Well, now that we've settled that. Sure, it was RoboCop's crusade through old Detroit's grimy underworld that ultimately saved the day, but it was Bob Morton who made it all possible. Thanks. And that about does it for this installment. We hope you've enjoyed this look at RoboCop so far, but we're really just getting started. Would you like to know more? Curious about where we're going with this? Are you interested? I know you are. Becoming convinced? Think we're crazy and way off base? Want to know what our classified fourth directive of storytelling is? Got any guesses? Come on back for part two, where we'll deep dive into Bob Morton's character and what it means for the overall message of RoboCop. Come quietly or there will be trouble. And in the meantime, don't forget to like, share, tweet, comment, subscribe, and ring the notification bell to stick with us. Stay up to date on our movie and TV analyses and see just what we'll have the audacity to say next. Oh, great. Thanks for watching. Ah, oh, you. Buy that for a dollar. <laughs> <laughs>